Hi, everybody. Here we are with the webinar, Being a Prescriber and Experiencing Prescribed Harm. My name is Carol, and I will be your host for today in this webinar, and I'm very happy to introduce the participants to you. Nicole Lamberson. Well, Nicole, let me start uh, <laughs> by saying to you, happy birthday. Oh, there you um. go. Because, Thank you so much. Yes, it's her birthday today. So I'm going to introduce you first. So Nicole Lamberson is a physician assistant, and she has been disabled by a protracted psychiatric drug withdrawal syndrome since 2010. But Nicole is healing. She volunteers with the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition and the Benzodiazepine Action Work Group of the Colorado Consortium. Nicole has also founded Inner Compass Initiatives, the Withdrawal Project, and she does marketing, distribution, and outreach for the Medicating Normal film. And she's an associate at the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. And we will be joined by Mark Horowitz and Louise Bondock. Uh, so let's tell you something about Louise. Dr. Louise Bondock, she's a psychiatrist living and working in Northwest England. And she graduated from Cambridge in history and philosophy of science in 2002, qualified as a doctor at St. George's University of London in 2009. And she trained as a psychiatrist at the Maudsley. And she is also a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And she has a special interest in psychotherapy and has lived experience of protective, protected, protracted antidepressant withdrawal. And then finally, of course, there's Dr. Mark Horowitz. He's a clinical research fellow in psychiatry in the Northeast London NHS Foundation. He's an honorary clinical research fellow at UCL and a trainee psychiatrist. He co-authored the Royal College of Psychiatry Guidance on Stopping Antidepressants, and he was also involved with the recent National Institute for Clinical Excellence Guidelines on Safe Discontinuation of Psychiatric Medications. And that's not all, because currently he's writing the Maudsley Deprescribing Guidelines in Psychiatry, and they will be published in 2023. And in the meantime, Mark is also a co-investigator on the release trial in Australia. And they are evaluating the effect of gradual hyperbolic tapering of antidepressants. Now, Mark has an interest in rational psychopharmacology and deprescribing psychiatric medication. And he has experienced coming off psychiatric medications firsthand, which has formed much of his work. And he has a lot to say about this. And I must warn you that there is some discussion of protracted withdrawal in the interview. And this might be upsetting for some people. So if that is you, please feel free to excuse yourself if necessary. But also remember, these are all personal experiences. And that doesn't mean that they will also happen to you. So let's go over to our presentation. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here with you. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining. My name is Nicole Lamberson, and I'm going to be hosting this conversation today for World Tapering Day. I'm joined by Mark Horowitz and Luis Bundock, who are both going to tell their stories. Um, Mark and Luis, welcome. You are both psychiatrists with personal experience of taking and tapering antidepressants. So I guess we can start the conversation with uh, both of you taking a few minutes to tell us about your personal experience with that. So who would like to go first? I'll, I'll go first. I'll go first. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm a training psychiatrist, done some of my training in Australia uh, and worked a little bit in London, mostly do research at the moment. Um, but yes, I've, I've uh, so I, I can tell you how I um, came to use antidepressants and, and then and then how I stopped them. So uh, I was, uh, I was 
uh, I did did my medical training in Australia in Sydney. Um, I did my psychiatry training. Uh, started it there and then moved to London to do a PhD uh, looking at antidepressants and the biology of depression. Uh, and I had been prescribed an antidepressant when I was in third year medical school. Um, as I've said as before, I was a I was a miserable uh, medical student. Didn't 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 love uh, memorizing endless uh, parts of the body and and different um, diseases. And I and I guess baseline, I'm a I'm a neurotic character. Um, and I I um, uh, went to my GP. Uh, I'd done some I'd read some self help books about CBT. Didn't find it helpful enough. Went to ask for a medication, basically. Um, and the GP wrote me a script very quickly, gave me uh, some um, trial packs, and I was very excited to try it. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd heard good things about it in lectures, um, and, and I, was, I was keen to give it a go. I took it. Um, I had a lot of uh, side effects to start with. I felt dizzy. I felt a bit out of it. Um, I felt a bit similar to being stoned a little bit. I went back, I um, asked for a different medication, said this, this one doesn't suit me. I tried another one, it had similar effects. I had strange yawning, went back a couple of times over a few weeks, ended up on uh, escitalopram or Lexapro. And I kind of thought, uh, these all seem to have, it, have side effects, so I'll just stick with this one. Um, and I took it continuously for the next, 15 years. Um, I, uh, you know, in part, I went to do a PhD in, in looking at how do antidepressants work and the biology of depression, because I thought, uh, you know, I want to understand more about myself, uh, why these drugs aren't as effective as people want them to be, how they can be improved. Um, at the end of my PhD, I came across um, a, a, a journal article actually written in a, in a a blog about it that talked about withdrawal symptoms from antidepressants. Um, and I had never heard about withdrawal symptoms from antidepressants before. And I found that a bit um, alarming because the drugs that I knew that caused withdrawal effects were drugs like benzodiazepines and opioids. And I thought such drugs, one, you get used to them, and two, they're not always uh, very good for you in the long term. And that put into my mind the idea of trying to come off the medications. And so what I did over the next little while while I was writing up my PhD um, was I looked up all the literature on how to come off antidepressants and basically all of it said you can come off in two to four weeks, month or two. There are mild uh, discontinuation symptoms. Some of the papers on that were written by professors at my institute. It was the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College of London uh, and a lot of the official guidance said that. And I thought, okay, that's uh, interesting. I, you know, uh, I, I also went to check Google and I came across people who said, no, it takes a lot longer than that to come off. It takes people months or years and some people have great difficulty. And I thought, oh, that was interesting. I thought I would sort of hedge my bets and go in between those two different accounts. And so I, I halved my drug every month for four months, basically. So over four months, I went from 20 milligrams of escitalopram down to about one milligram of escitalopram. Um, things started getting rocky when I was down at two, three, four, five milligrams. By the time I was at one milligram, I was having trouble sleeping. I was having basically panic attacks that would last most of the day. I would feel like I was being chased like a chased by a wild animal or something on the edge of a cliff. Um, my heart was beating, my arms were sweaty. Um, I, I, I couldn't get a moment of peace. Um, I felt dizzy. I felt that things were not quite real around me. I felt in a kind of dreamlike space. Um, and I, I've never, I, I had never felt like that in my entire life before. When I went on the medication, I was a, uh, you know, like I think, like any character in a Woody Allen film, neurotic, tick, pessimistic, uh, you know, um, a, a bit of a mess um, as a medical student, but nothing like what happened to me when I came off these medications. I, ha I had never experienced panic like that in my life. Um, 
and there were these strange dizziness, things that I'd never had before. Um, I didn't want to go back up on the medication um, in part because, as a slight aside, uh, I, I come across people who said that they had become very tired and had trouble thinking straight whilst on the medication. And that was something that had happened to me. I'd had years of trouble with concentration, memory and fatigue. And coming across that in other people's accounts made me start to think, uh, were these problems in my life that were a very big deal for me due to the medication itself? And so for that reason, I was very keen not to go back on it. And so I held on, I white knuckled it for several weeks. It became worse and worse. It became, you know, very, I started running 10 kilometres a day, every day, as a, as a fairly couch potato type person back then, just, just to get a little bit of reprieve from how panicked and terrible I felt. And, and running 10 kilometres would give me an hour or two of feeling better, and that was worth it. And at that point, I think I was running until my toes bled. Um, eventually, it actually became so horrible, I, I moved from London, where I was living at the time, back to my parents' house in Australia in my mid-30s, not, not the proudest moment of my life. I, I was in complete pieces. I didn't know what to do. I ended up going, I, I was very confused. I thought, do I need to be on more of this medication? But the medication seems to be causing me terrible side effects, I think. Do I need to be on less of it? Because when I come off it, I, I'm in you know terrible strife. I was completely confused. Um, and in the end, I went back on a higher dose. Uh, I think I even went up to a, a maybe a high dose than I was on previously. And over several weeks, things calmed down and I ended up basically back to where I was before I I'd come off the drug. Um, and I went back to training in psychiatry for a couple of years, kind of having at the back of my mind, the suspicion that the drugs were not quite as simple to stop or, or, or um, quite as, as, as simple as they were presented, but I, I stayed on them. In fact, in that time, I saw more doctors and I ended up getting more medications uh, to, about, to, to manage fatigue. Um, anyway, now four years ago, I decided to try to come off again. Um, and this time, having learned from this experience last time, I thought I would listen to people on the internet. So this is people on forums like Surviving Antidepressants um, uh, that, I, that I, I now read very carefully and decided coming off over two or four weeks was ridiculous. Coming off over four months was, was ridiculous for me, too much too quick. And so I decided to come off over, over I, I thought this would definitely take me more than a year. Um, I came off as slowly as they were recommending on these sites. I think I started at 20% a month, uh, ended up going at 10% a month towards the end. Um, and doing that, I guess a couple of things happened. One, as I came off this medication, um, I felt less tired, my concentration improved, my memory was altogether better, which sort of confirmed my initial impression. I had withdrawal symptoms, I had dizziness, I had a sense that things were not real, I had some trouble sleeping, but not nearly as severe as when I'd come off it in four months, years before. Um, and that process has continued. I'm now in my fourth year of tapering. Um, I think some people find that a bit alarming. I think I've gone much slower than I could have done because I've worked full time throughout the period of, of tapering. I think if I had um, stayed on it, if, I, if I'd taken a break from work, I probably could have come off it in a couple of years. Um, but things have slowed down because I got very busy recently. Uh, and so, you know, where I am now, I'm, I happen to be on 0.2 milligrams of escitalopram. I actually also ended up on metazapine, which I found harder to come off than escitalopram. I'm on 1.5 milligrams of that, starting at 15. Uh, and I'll probably take another year or two to come off. Uh, it still gives me unpleasant days when I feel like I can't think straight, um, especially when I go a little bit quicker because I, I get a bit impatient sometimes like everyone else does. Uh, but I've kind of found a way for it to sort of be in the background. I still always have residual symptoms. I'm not completely well, um, but but I can sort of see in a year or two, I'll, I'll be off it and, and hopefully start to uh, improve after that. So I went on a bit long there, but that's that's my that's been my story. Yeah, thanks for sharing it. Um, Luis, would you like to share yours? Yeah, sure. Um, 
just to say thanks to Carol and World Tapering Day for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm actually going to read, I've just written down an account of my, my story. I'm not so um, used to sort of talking about it publicly as yet, so I thought I might find that easier. Um, so my name is Dr Louise Bondock. I'm a psychiatrist currently living in Manchester in the northwest of the UK. I qualified as a doctor in 2009 and have been working and training in psychiatry for 11 years now. <clears throat> Every doctor in the UK works as a junior doctor for two years before picking an area of medicine to specialise in. In 2011, in my second year of being a junior doctor, I experienced burnout. Instead of taking the time off work I needed, I felt I'd be letting my patients and colleagues down, so I started an antidepressant. At the time I thought this had helped me, but in hindsight what it did was get me back into a working environment which wasn't healthy for me. It also made me hypomanic, which had disastrous consequences for my relationship and my personal life. The domino effect of this led to me being switched onto venlafaxine a year later as I, as I was feeling worse, not better. I didn't experience any noticeable side effects from venlafaxine other than possibly not being able to process my experiences and the grief I felt over the losses I'd incurred. <coughs> Around two years into taking venlafaxine, I tried to stop the medication. I actually did that um, fairly quickly, like much too suddenly. Um, and I felt extremely unwell and acutely suicidal, which I'd never experienced before. I believed myself to be relapsing um, and immediately restarted the medication. In hindsight, this was clearly withdrawal. I then took the next two and a bit years to come down stepwise very slowly through the commercially available doses. I thought I was tapering slowly and responsibly and in some ways being a psychiatrist did me a disservice as I assumed if there was something to know about coming off psychiatric medication safely, I would know it already. I now know that the lay withdrawal community currently holds far more detailed knowledge about safe tapering and withdrawal from psychiatric medications than the medical community. After five years on venlafaxine, I took my last dose in November 2017. Ironically, I took it before the weekend, thinking I might not feel great for a couple of days, and that would give me time to recover before starting work again the following week. Nearly five years on, I still have neurological symptoms that limit my quality of life. I know this will be a familiar story to many of you. Acute withdrawal kicked in and really intensified two months later. Organic terror, insomnia, agitation, very painful dissociative symptoms, which is the sense of like unreality and disconnection that Mark was talking about, are just a few of the many, many symptoms I experienced. <clears throat> my blood pressure was so high, my kidneys were damaged. Every part of our bodies contains nerves and neurotransmitters. So when damaged by a drug that affects the nervous system, our symptoms are experienced in every part of our bodies. It would not be an overstatement to say that in the worst weeks and months, I felt like I was being physically and mentally tortured. I lost control over my mind, my body, my brain, my sense of myself. I lost my work, my financial stability, my social life, my ability to do the things I enjoy. I had to move back in with my parents at the age of 40. I've survived psychologically by trying to hang on to the deepest part of my being and the belief that I would one day recover. The hardest days have been a case of taking things one hour, one minute or one breath at a time. Things are much better than they were, but I still have residual neurological symptoms. More generally, things have started to change in the time I've been recovering. Withdrawal and the need for safer, slower tapering and much smaller steps is gradually becoming better understood and acknowledged, thanks in no small part to people like Mark and Nicole. We still have a long way to go before every prescriber understands the full extent of the risks of psychiatric medications. Personally, I believe the two most fundamentally mis misunderstood aspects of this issue are that Firstly, that the severity of withdrawal symptoms often far, far outstrips the original illness or anything that our friends, families and doctors can relate to. And second, that it can last an incredibly long time, sometimes years. I know that this can be a very frightening thought for those people in acute withdrawal. Please remember this may not be you. 
I look at fellow withdrawal sufferers and they often look normal, perhaps a bit tired or drawn. I know that they are often enduring unbearable suffering, completely unacknowledged. This is an invisible disability far beyond what most people have any frame of reference for in their own bodies. Very true, everything you said. Thanks so much, Luis and Mark, both of you for sharing your stories. I know a lot of people will relate. I related to so much uh, being a fellow sufferer myself, just sitting here and, and listening. So I think now that people have a, a better sense of who you are and what you've experienced, um, we can jump into some more general questions about, you know, being a psychiatrist and your, your um feelings about the medications and what you were taught and, and those kinds of things. So I guess first, since you both trained as, as psychiatrists, what did you feel about antidepressants when you first started using them? Um, well, I guess I had, um, I, I had a sense they were very benign. I think was was number one. You know, I I guess in my mind they were they were a bit like paracetamol. I, you know, I I knew people in my family and friends who were on them. Um, they were, you know, I was I wasn't working as a as a doctor when I took them. I was um, in medical school. I guess I had this sense that you know drugs that are uh, given to patients are you know tested very carefully and they're safe and and effective, um, and and it was. Yeah, it, to me, it was like going to the doctor to get antibiotics or paracetamol. I, I had a very, uh, in retrospect, ill-informed, um, you know, naive view of, of of the medications that I'm, I'm sure everyone else around me also also has. So about you, Louise? Um, yeah, I guess I had kind of mixed feelings. Um, I think there was one part of me that was working as a junior doctor and kind of recommending these treatments to people, although I wasn't a psychiatrist at that point. I was seeing people come into A&E with, you know, clearly like having anxiety symptoms or other mental health problems. Um, so there was a bit of me that was like, oh, well, you know, this is a treatment that I'm endorsing. Like on some level, I believe that they work and I'm being told that they work. I'm being told that they're safe. Um, people that, I'm tr like, that I trust are telling me that they're safe, the literature appears to say that they're safe. So on, on the one hand, there was like my doctor part of me that was like, okay, well, maybe this is something that could help with the way that I'm feeling at the minute. And I suppose there was another part of me as well that would have ideally liked to avoid taking medication. It wasn't my first choice of, you know, something to do, but um, I think at the time I was just really worried about not being able to function at work and, what the consequences of that would be like for my for my colleagues for my patients you know the NHS is very stretched I'd known other doctors to go off sick and seeing the consequences of that for their teams and I didn't I didn't want to be that person so if it was a way for me to be able to kind of continue working and functioning then yeah I thought I would give it a go okay so both of you sort of touched on this. Maybe you have uh, something to add. Um, did your training as a psychiatrist teach you anything about what could go wrong when you tried to come off of antidepressants? I can, I can answer that very simply. It's, it's, it's a very short answer. I think the answer is just no. You know, I, I, I hadn't, you know, I... I um, I had never had a lecture about stopping any psychiatric drug, you know, in my in, in medical school or in my training. Um, you know, I had to quip the first lecture that I heard about stopping the drug was one that I gave. Um, you know, I, I hadn't heard about withdrawal symptoms from antidepressants. I actually don't think I'd even heard about discontinuation symptoms from antidepressants. I sort of, um, you know, it's racked my brain. Was that ever mentioned? Not, not that I recall. So, you know, I, I looked it up for the first time when I considered stopping, you know, the end of my PhD, you know, I had never, I don't think that I'd ever stopped a medication for a patient, you know, not, not in any concerted way, maybe I'd switched things around, but I'd never sat down and thought, how can I get a patient off a medication? It had just not come up really 
except in switching from something that didn't work for someone to something else. So I, it was the first time I looked at guidelines or, or, or um, you know, or thought about the issue. So no, I was in no better position than anybody else out there. I would say that um, nobody had ever really, like the issue of withdrawal symptoms definitely wasn't as talked about, well, it wasn't really talked about at all. And um, there was a sense that you definitely shouldn't stop taking um, an antidepressant suddenly or another psychiatric medication suddenly. Um, I'd heard the idea that um, somebody might feel unwell for like four to six weeks, two to four weeks after coming off an antidepressant. Um, so I guess my feeling, you know, when I started to feel unwell, my feeling was, OK, like I feel terrible, but this is only going to last for two to four weeks because I really believed what I'd been taught. Um, so I guess, yeah, like very basic, quite misinformed things, I suppose, were um, were touched on during my training. OK, so sort of. Uh you know, going along with that question, your training as a psychiatrist, I guess, did it help you recover in any way from withdrawal? Did you have any tidbits of knowledge or, you know, insider information that sort of helped you when it came to figuring things out? Do you, do you want me to answer that, Mark? I got it, yeah. Um, I would say in answer to that question, it, I think it was a hindrance and a help for me, or it has been. I think, like I alluded to before, I think it actually meant that I didn't look for other sources of information because I assumed if there was something to know, I would already know it as a doctor and as a psychiatrist. Um, so I probably like pushed through the early days of acute withdrawal um, with way too little information and I probably would do things differently like if I had my time again I would try and you know I would taper a lot more slowly and safely so in that way it wasn't a helpful thing for me um, in other ways I think it has been helpful it's um, I suppose once I got my head around what was happening it's meant that I've been able to like find information um, I've been able to communicate with my GPs, like my family doctor, my general practitioner, in a way that I think I've probably had a lot more support from my general practice than people who are maybe going to them not as doctors in withdrawal. Um, I've known what I needed to get from them in terms of like medical tests and um, yeah, so I'd say it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's helped me in some ways and, and not helped me in others. Yeah, that's a really good point, Louise. I've thought the same thing too, is, you know, having all the privilege of being a medical provider and going to another doctor or medical provider and still having a little bit of trouble mm. being believed or explaining mm -hmm. it, like then what do, you know, people who aren't in medicine experience? So Mark, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, I guess it probably did help me at different bits. Um, I, I sort of knew that going back on medication would probably improve withdrawal effects, although I sort of understand now it can be a bit more hit and miss. But for me, that worked. I sort of had that in my mind as that's a fallback. If things go wrong, going back on medication would help, and it, it did help me. Um, you know, uh, I... Um, we're talking to, to, to doctors. I mean, I, I can't remember exactly what I did the first time I came off. I think I did get a liquid. So I think I must have had the wherewithal to go to a doctor and ask for a liquid and probably, I don't know, the confidence with which I asked for it or could explain it probably did make it easy because I know lots of patients have great trouble getting a liquid from their doctors. Um, you know, now, you know, I still go to my GP to get a, a liquid you know, occasionally one of the GPs I saw was very on it, understood things. You know, I was, uh, you know, I, I brought in a paper that I'd written from the Lancet, probably like other patients do, to explain what I was doing. Once when there was a locum GP, they weren't so interested. They were a bit dismissive of me. I thought, you know, I'm getting a real sense of what it must be like for lots of other people. You know, but I, I sort of held my ground and, and said, you know, this is, there's a new guidelines, you should do this. And eventually she agreed. But I, you know, 
for me, it was a little bit hard to make the point and I'd helped to write, you know, some of the guidelines for the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So I can certainly imagine what an uphill battle it is to convince doctors um, who are not, you know, if you're not in that, yes, exactly privileged position of, of, um, of being a doctor. Uh, yeah, so it probably was helpful and I can just imagine how, how much harder it is for other people. Okay, so this is kind of a loaded question and probably one hard to answer, but why do you think that psychiatrists, GPs, other medical providers have been so slow to recognize these withdrawal effects from not only antidepressants, but all psychiatric drugs and, you know, that these tapers need to take months and years instead of weeks and you know that sometimes the effects of withdrawal can be as devastating as the both of you explained why do you think it's been so slow on the, on the uptake should i should i answer that sure. um i i think the major reason is because the guidelines have said otherwise you know the guidelines in england up until a couple of years ago said you know, discontinuation symptoms are mild and brief that last for a week or two. That's, you know, that's the, you know, uh, with a slight addendum can be severe for some people if stopped abruptly, you know, and the teaching around is symptoms are mild, week or two. Um, you know, doctors are very good at memorizing guidelines. That's what we do. That's what we practice. That's what I did in medical school. It's what you do as a doctor. You're checking guidelines. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, that forms, you know, the truth in our minds, um, you know, not, you know, your average GP or your average psychiatrist is not reading research papers. Um, they're not looking at the latest things. They're going by, you know, guidelines and what they're taught by, you know, in, in educational seminars. Um, you know, the literature has been suffused with academic papers put out by industry-backed academics that say the discontinuation symptoms are mild and brief. You know, there was a there was a consensus panel in the late 90s organized by Eli Lilly that put together this, basically this information packet for GPs and psychiatrists in the form of many academic articles using this phrase again and again, discontinuation symptoms are mild and brief. So that's what informed the guidelines. Even if you went to go look at the academic research, you will hit the phrases discontinuation symptoms mild and brief again and again. And so that's formed, that's formed the informational landscape around people. Um, so, you know, you're, I guess you're taught in medicine to be skeptical of patient histories. You know, you're always trying to work out, is this a heart attack or is this just, you know, panic? So you've got to look at everything with skepticism. And I think when you have patients coming in and saying, I've got severe symptoms, I'm having panic attacks. Uh, you know, this is worse than anything I've ever had in my life. Then there's two categories in their minds. There's relapse, which is drummed into you in, 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 in teaching. You know, relapse is a constant threat. You're going to get unwell again. And you've got discontinuation symptoms, which is barely there. You know, I hadn't really heard about it. Um, and so when you've got those two categories, you know, relapse is the big one. And that's the, that's the thing that people fit there. It's the, that's the category that doctors fit patient stories into very easily. Um, and they're not even, you know, they're not even thinking about, should I be asking about dizziness or headache or things that would distinguish this from relapse? Someone comes in and says, I feel terrible. I want to kill myself. I can't sleep. You know, it doesn't take more than a couple of seconds to think this person's relapsing. They just come off their medication. Um, I think there are rare clinicians out there that have, heard this story either a few times and clicked that this is not quite right. But you've got to know the patient quite well to work that out. You've got to know what they were like when they first went on the medication to be able to distinguish. So you need a bit of continuity of care. Um, you need to be probably a bit skeptical of what you're being told by guidelines and very open to what the patient's telling you because you've sort of got in this, you know, I guess it's a, a form of epistemic injustice. You've got the powerful um, importance of guidelines, which also you know, have a legal aspect to them because you're not following guidelines. You could be practicing in a way that's not consistent with your uh, credentials versus listening to a patient saying something completely different. You know, I've heard again from uh, from patients, they, they, they get told by their clinicians, even ones who recognize withdrawal is, you know, this is very rare, I never hear this. 
And I think that part of the reason people are not hearing is because they're seeing relapse. So there's a kind of an ignorance of the category of withdrawal. So of course you never see it. Um, and then the idea that you need to taper over much longer, you know, corresponds to that. If you think withdrawal is only a week or two and it's mild and brief, why would you need to go to these incredible um, efforts of months and years with liquids? You know, it sounds like overkill. Um, you know, I think that those are those are some of the reasons why why doctors are are not seeing it. Um, yeah. Okay. Could I add something to that? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's also I think everything Mark said is completely right um, I also think there's something around the way we make knowledge in medicine um, and the way we look at scientific knowledge generally um, I actually my first degree was in history and philosophy of science um, I then later went on to, to do to train to be to be a doctor um, and the whole of my first degree was essentially about how science is not objective um, and yet in society and in medical training we view the information that we're given as as the objective truth and I think we are as doctors taught to critique um, research in the sense of looking at a research paper and breaking down, do we think that this is a good study or a bad study? Could it be improved in any way? But we're not taught to step back and critique the whole process of building medical and scientific knowledge. Um, so doctors are being trained that they, they, do hold, they do hold the truth and they do hold to some degree the objective truth. We talk a lot about evidence-based medicine that if we set all of our store by meta-analyses and randomized control trials, then you're as close as possible to being to the truth as you can be. Um, but I think unless you step back and think about, well, which studies are being funded and why and by whom and what, what research questions are we not looking at, um, then it's not until that point that you realize that there's huge gaps in our scientific knowledge. And your average, I have to say, like your average GP or psychiatrist, like every doctor I know, um, with almost no exceptions, works incredibly hard and really truly wants the best for their patients. But I think we've been educated in a system that tells us that we, like, we hold the knowledge and we hold the truth. And the things that we're being taught, if we're being taught that these drugs are safe, then that is true. And if somebody comes along with information that conflicts with that, then doctors don't really know where, where to put that information. Um, and it would require like a huge shift in thinking to step into another sort of paradigm, if you like, of, okay, well, maybe the, maybe the tools of our trade aren't as sort of safe and benign as we've been taught. So I think sometimes people who've experienced prescribed harm uh, operating in a world where we know that these medications aren't as safe as they're being made out, but the people that we're going to for those medications or for help with our, our mental health or our health are operating in a completely different paradigm. And it's very hard to sort of communicate um, between the two. Um, so I think, I think that's part of the, another, you know, another part of the reason why it's taking um, the medical profession a bit longer to, to really adopt this research that's coming out about the risks around withdrawal and the risks of prescribed harm. Yeah, make, that makes a lot of sense, but what both of you said, for sure. So talking about some of the science and the studies that you've just brought up, um, what about uh, attention being paid to the safe tapering of psychiatric drugs? I mean, I've been around in the withdrawal communities for over 12 years now. And I feel like, you know, there's a lot more information than there was when I first showed up. But Mark, do you do you feel like there is uh, any more attention being paid to, um, to tapering and safe tapering as far as studies go? Yeah, so I'll just add one point to the last discussion, but I'll talk about that question as well. Sure. To give back on what Louise has said, I mean, Made a very good point you know 
in that the evidence base, you know, this this repetition of the evidence based medicine is is the platform of what we do. You know, that there is there is social construction of what the evidence base is, as you know, as Louise said, it's people choose what studies are being done, you know, and and in material that's been covered well elsewhere, of course, drug companies are, you know, fund 95% of drug studies. So they're choosing which studies are done, you know, and their influence, you know, is much more insidious than we think because a lot of the, you know, Louise has talked about the average doctor, you know, on the front lines, and I completely agree, but the people who are transmitting information are academic psychiatrists, you know, many of whom get quite a lot of funding in, in support for giving lectures on our area, support for their research from drug companies. And, you know, they become the spokespeople of, of these drugs often. You know, there are maybe it was more egregious in the past and more egregious in America as we speak, where doctors are actually turning up and giving talks with Eli Lilly at the bottom of their lectures, um, which is still happening in America, a bit less in England, but still there. And so doctors, these psychiatry academics, uh, you know, actually become the face of these drugs, really. I, I once heard someone say celebrities are the face of corporations. You don't, you don't hear from, you know, the CEO of Coke telling you Coke is good. You hear from a Kardashian. So the Kardashian becomes the face of the corporations. And in medicine, professors at Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard become the face of drug companies because they are being paid by these people, by these companies in order to represent these drugs. Um, but when you're a student or a, or a jobbing doctor and you're seeing a very impressive professor at Harvard or Cambridge or Oxford give you a lecture about a drug, you may not be aware that the company's written the lectures. You may not be aware that the material's being sculpted or by, by, by those companies. Not to mention the fact that the, the studies that are being presented are done by the companies. You know, in some ways, the entire landscape of medicine is constructed by large companies of which professors and seminars and lectures and medical education are all just bits of the scenery. Um, so, you know, just as a specific example, so I'm not talking in, in, in generalities. Um, one, one thing that's related to withdrawal, the best, so all these studies, there are, there, are, there are a couple of dozen studies on withdrawal effects from antidepressants, for example. And the vast majority of them go for eight weeks. People are given the drugs for eight weeks, which are the drugs done, which are the studies done to approve these drugs for, by regulators. The drugs are then stopped. People are monitored for two weeks. And for most people, not everyone, some of those people experience severe side effects, uh, withdrawal effects, but most people have mild symptoms that last for a week or two. And so this phrase, mild symptoms, brief, you know, is based on a study. So you can say it's an evidence-based finding. But of course, we know the longer you're on a drug, the more likely you are to have withdrawal effects and for them to be severe. So people can walk around and say it's an evidence-based finding that these symptoms are mild and brief. But of course, that's a constructed finding because if you did it with people who are on the drugs for five years, you wouldn't find that. But it, it gives the illusion of, um, you know, there being an evidence base that these things are not bad. Um, and there's a great book written by a, a, an Australian psychiatrist, John Giordini, called The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine. So you know, my position is, I'm not arguing against evidence-based medicine, I'm for evidence-based medicine. Um, I think it's, you know, there, are, there are deficiencies, but the, the evidence is you know, very much constructed by people with you know, often financial um, interests. And so it's been it's been used as a manipulative tool. It's been you know its its initial idea is being is being um, spun by by commercial interests. So so I'm not against evidence based medicine, but I but I completely agree it's it's been done in a certain way. Uh, and I think that relates to your question. Um, you know, this att attention to safe tapering psychiatric drugs. You know, you can summarize the attention very easily. There are one thousand studies on starting antidepressants. And there are 14 studies on stopping antidepressants. So there's an incredible, you know, lack of balance in the attention. And that's because, of course, drug companies make money from starting drugs, not from stopping drugs. Um, but, you know, I agree with you, Nicole. Yes, there's been more interest, you know, in part because uh, 
you know you and and, and others have have drummed up a little bit of um a fuss about it all um so at least in england yes there is more attention paid to withdrawal effects there's been more guidelines um there's starting to be studies around in in england in australia and in, and in holland um you know there's, we're still well well behind um studies on starting medication so there's a lot of room to make up it's still hard to get doctors to pay attention to this issue i think more are um uh, you know but there's a long way to go from from best practice in some guideline into what's actually happening in suburban practices so there's 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 still a huge gap louise did you have anything to add to that um yeah, I guess one thing that was on my mind as you were speaking, Mark, was also, you know, in this hier hierarchy of evidence that gets talked about in medicine with different kinds of studies sort of ranked in different order of importance with meta-analyses at the top. And then this is a bit technical for people who aren't medical, but just to give people an idea, there's meta-analyses at the top, then randomised control trials, then other kinds of studies. And at the very bottom, you've got case studies, which are essentially people's stories they're interesting cases that people have thought, okay, you know, this would be helpful for people to know about, but that's considered like the weakest form of evidence. And I think there's, that we really lose something in medicine when we dismiss people's stories. Um, I think that's how we learn as human beings. That's how our minds are kind of wired. Um, and we also lose a huge amount of important information because there's a sense of like, oh, one one person's story isn't important. It's not. It's not. It's not useful scientific evidence. Um, so that was just something that was, yeah, occurring to me. Yeah. Uh, can I add, sorry. Oh, can I add one yeah. thing to, to that. Sorry. Um, sure. Because I. I, I I mean, Louise is right about the, the hierarchy of evidence and I'm not, um, but I would say those sort of things are, are, are used in a manipulative fashion, for example, by academics who want to shut down discussion about these, these sort of issues. Um, and I put it to you like this, uh, how many, uh, if you, if, if, how many stories would you have to hear of the mobile phone in your pocket? bursting into flames when plugged into certain um sockets how many how many of those stories would you have to hear before you went to the shop to ask for a replacement i think the answer is three uh, you know because if it goes wrong with one unit you know it could be a fluke three starts to suggest there's something in the system itself that's a problem so actually in medicine a case study is very important you know if you hear that someone's done some operation and it helped solve a disease that isn't solved elsewhere, you're listening with one case. With three cases, you're listening closely. So I think um, that hierarchy is used manipulatively by people who want to just stop discussion of, of things, because if there's not large studies done, then the best evidence around is a case study. You know, if someone can be sick for, for years, from a, a from coming off a drug and you hear there's 10 of them that's a very you know to a, to a sensible independent observer that is an important signal that something is going on requires investigation so i think people are uh, yield wielding this hierarchy as a way to shut down discussion and it's not used elsewhere in, in the same way you know so I, I i'd be wary of being shushed or being told that it's not important because it's down this hierarchy of evidence you know just using common sense if something happens to lots of people there might be something there so i uh, just put that there yeah I totally agree and similarly when you know as a psychiatrist when people come to you and complain of symptoms right like i feel depressed or i feel anxious that's that's as much anecdote, right, as uh, someone coming and saying, well, I feel bad when I try to come off the antidepressant, right? Is there much difference in that? Yes, yes, I guess you could say that when they hear an anecdote of things going in the direction that they want to hear, then it's then it's it's worth repeating. And when it goes against what they want to hear, it's it's uh, it's dismissed. So there's definitely, you might say politely, there's, there's values and preferences expressed in, in which evidence people listen to or, or, or don't. Right. 
Okay. So, um, Luis, I know this is uh, the first time you've come forward, if I'm not mistaken, telling your story. But Mark, you've told yours quite a lot. So I'm just wondering um, uh, how how have colleagues of yours in medicine responded to, to the story? Um, Luis, when you've told maybe colleagues that you've known um, about what happened to you, were you believed or disbelieved? Um, ha- have you been able to change anybody's thinking? That kind of thing. Um, I have to say I haven't had any... Um sort of unpleasant experiences every I haven't kind of it's something that as I've gradually got better um I felt more able to talk about I mean to begin with I wasn't able to work at all um so I wasn't I wasn't engaging with my colleagues in that way um I have to say the 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 people that I have over time told have been receptive and supportive but I would I would I think it's very difficult to really convey the extremeness of what um, withdrawal syndrome can be like. So I think people get a sense of like, yeah, something difficult and uh, challenging has happened. Um, They're open to that. But I think in terms of people truly taking on board the, um, the sort of what's the word I'm looking for like the um the intensity the significance of what I've been through I think it's very I mean I think it's difficult to convey that to anyone including our like loved ones um but yeah I've I've been I've had I've had good experiences generally talking to colleagues I don't know about it changing anyone's practice I think people that I've been at was at medical school with who are like friends of mine and who now practice as psychiatrists and GPs I think Maybe it's changed a couple of my friends' um, prescribing habits. But yeah, um, I still think there's this issue around how do you truly convey how um, awful withdrawal is, for want of a better word. Yeah, especially when sometimes there's just no language. I've struggled to put words to, you know, to the experience. So, Mark? Yeah, I I I I I share the experience. Um, I I I very much agree that yes, the full intensity of the experience is not appreciated by anybody that hasn't been through it. I guess because you know it's hard to find the words. I'd say although I've had some sympathetic hearings from friends of mine and I, the, the doctors, mostly GPs or psychiatrists. Um, I think no one. I mean, it's, yeah, no one fully gets the extent of it. It's only people that have been through it that really get it. Um, and I think that li- that limits then how much of an impact it has on them. So I, a few friends that I've really talked their ears off, I think are definitely prescribing less medication now and are much more open to stopping things slowly. But I think, you know, again, in this, in this sort of barrage of information, these guidelines, this just hearing one guy say this happened, you know, is, is sort of minor in the whole framework of um uh of information i i made a huge mistake i signed up to medscape to, to to log on to see some story and i now get like 10 to 12 um seminars on how to treat depression new guidance and depression new drug coming into my inbox i can't stop it's, it's sort of unsubscribe like it's, it's 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 immune to being unsubscribed from you know i just sort of think that's just one example of there's this huge amount of information coming at you give this drug this is better than that and, you know hearing one voice say i had a horrible time is just one piece of information in this in this in this area you know in fact you know i'm i'm in contact with a lot of critically minded psychiatrists people that are you know generally focused on the social causes of of mental health conditions are skeptical of medicine and i think even they still don't quite appreciate you know the life-threatening severity and that's you know, I didn't say this time, but, but Louise said it, you know, I thought about killing myself in withdrawal. It's not something that had crossed my mind, you know, as a neurotic young person, I was miserable, but but I, it was so terrifying. It was so unpleasant. I couldn't see, you know, could, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to keep going. Um, you know, I think people don't appreciate, you know, that's, yeah, that's the, the level of, of, of intensity that these things involve. Um, and I can kind of, and it causes huge trouble, of course. You know, if you can't give a, a class of drugs, 
um, and actually there's lots of drugs that are similar to it and actually it causes you to rethink the entire treatments that you're giving, you know, and starts to question the, the basis of your profession and your employment and your mortgage. It becomes very difficult to follow those thoughts. You know, I, I've had, you know, I've been pushed into it because my life has been so disrupted by coming off drugs. Um, you know, I have the advantage of some basic research skills that have let me turn this a bit into my work. So I'm in a very you know, uniquely priv privileged position. I could kind of see myself almost um, if I'd gone through it, didn't have other options. I might try to rationalize the whole thing. Oh, I'm an exception. You know, I'll be more careful. I'll use a softer drug. I'll do it. You know, I would start to rationalize it just so I could keep working. You know, I'll just give you an example. A friend of mine reached out a couple of years ago. His wife was having trouble coming off venlafaxine and I helped her come off over 18 months, you know, down by small bits. Uh, I think they were, they were counting beads. Um, and I said, you know, you know, all the studies are based on these drugs being stopped in five days. You know, all the realized prevention studies don't make sense. You know, uh, there's huge trouble being caused for people. And he basically you know, didn't want to hear about it. He wanted to get his wife off the drug, but he works as a psychiatrist. I know he's got a mortgage. I know he's got young children. He didn't want to go, you know, and blow up his life by challenging his colleagues or changing his practice or, you know, causing a fuss. So as far as I know, he's gone back into practicing, continued practicing exactly as he had beforehand. Um, you know, just, you know, and I've heard people rationalize it as well. Uh, people that I work with that I respect who are interested in this topic kind of put it in the category of they think, well, 1% of people are affected by this. Uh, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's bad and we should help them, but you know, let's not throw out the, the bait, the, the huge baby with the bathwater. You know, every medication hurts people and this is just a minor, uh, you know, a sacrifice that needs to be made. So there's there's a kind of, you know, I'd, I'd say there's no evidence as 1%. That's, I think that's ridiculous underestimate, but that's a way of rationalizing it to keep going with what you're doing, basically. Mm -hmm. So so on a one-to-one -one basis, most of my friends that are psychiatrists, you know, have given a sympathetic hearing. It sounds bad. I'm sorry that happened to you. You know, some of them, I think, have decided to take them more slowly. But I think going down the rabbit hole that it opens up for you, what are these drugs doing? What do they do to the brain? You know, what does it mean about long-term use? All the questions that, that inevitably come out are very difficult to pursue when you're, you know, you've got a family and a mortgage and you spent 15 years studying the, the profession. So I think most people don't have the, the intellectual you know, or financial opportunity to, to think about those things because it, it leads to very difficult questions. Yeah, very good points. So we've talked about, you know, having privilege as being uh, trained as a medical provider and, um, you know, interacting with other doctors and getting help for this situation. But most people are just average lay people trying to navigate this situation that they find themselves in with antidepressants and then uh, other psychiatric medications. They have no medical knowledge or training. Um, so how are they, how, how do you think they can best navigate uh, that from that position? Um. I think it's extremely difficult and um, I think that yeah I think that there just to know there is a huge amount of expertise technical expertise within the lay withdrawal community and the tapering community um there are people out there who've been figuring this stuff out themselves for decades and have kind of learned through trial and error and um, learned the hard way essentially and I think yeah to kind of broaden your sources of information as much as possible um, look on as many different websites as you can look on as many different forums as you can if you know I know that that's not always easy for someone in in withdrawal with cognitive symptoms or um, personally I couldn't I've found a lot of going on a lot of the withdrawal websites too difficult in the early years of withdrawal. 
Um, I just had to keep things extremely simple and calm and um, yeah, that wasn't something that felt comfortable for me. But um, but yeah, if people can to kind of broaden their sources of information as much as possible, um, to know that, you know, your medical practitioner isn't necessarily going to be the best source of information. They're still, it's still important to have a relationship with them in terms of getting excluding other things that could be causing symptoms um you know it's important to get blood tests and um, investigations if you're concerned that something might be a new symptom that might not be withdrawal it's important to not get so alienated from the medical profession that you know a lot of people get doctor phobic understandably because they feel they've been let down and why is this person giving me this medication that's made me so sick um, but I think if you can maintain that relationship and make sure that you're still getting checked out for physical health issues, that's really important, part of self-care. Um, yeah, I don't know, is there something else you'd like to add to that, Mark? No, I think that's, I think that's very good for people who are going through and trying to survive. You know, you, you, you should look at whatever information is around and um you know there's more and more papers and guidelines around that you can you can you can bring um i might talk to people who are maybe a bit further along in the process um and, and say um you know you, you use words like powerlessness and so forth you know i would say um and i think it's starting to to be obvious you know there's a lot of power in people getting together and trying to make this issue heard about you know there's a um so i have to pull it up so i don't i don't garble it you know there's a quote from margaret mead who's a famous anthropologist in america who said never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world and it is the only thing that ever has you know a lot of what's happened if there's been movement on this topic has happened because of organizations that nicole's a part of and started um benzodiazepine Open information coalition and like Laura Delano starting the Inner Compass initiative uh, and other initiatives around like the International Institute of Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal and actually World Tapering Day by people like Carol. You know, there are people probably starting to realize there's tens of thousands of people on these Facebook sites and peer-led websites. There are huge numbers of people who are probably not aware of these sites. There's a lot of people affected by this, by this problem. There are, you know, there's probably a quarter of a billion people on these drugs. You know, uh, and and the and the studies say that half of these people are going to have trouble coming off. So, I mean, this is it's a huge medical problem. It's a huge human rights issue because you know that the health and well-being of all these people are being um, threatened. You know, really by, in my view, commercial intrusion into medicine by by large companies with the spread of huge misinformation. Um, you know, with vectors paying academics and buying studies so this is a huge you know human rights issue in, in my mind uh everyone you know i know people are very unwell and and, and you know that's the, the main focus should be getting well but you know everyone can do a small thing talk about it to a friend you know tell their doctor you know i sort of i i, I sort of know it's a very unfair thing to say to someone you've been very unwell your doctor hasn't helped you they're giving you lots of trouble but but you know, go back to them and explain to them patiently, but it, it, it is useful. You know, doctors are not going to hear it if you're shouting at them, although you probably have cause to, but, you know, you bring them a paper, you say, you know, please read this. I think, you know, three people go to the same doctor, the doctor notices, um, and more and more people are doing that. There's more and more um, guidelines to give to people or, or papers, uh, you know, write complaints, report your what's happened to you to the, the the adverse effects schemes around the world there's there's the yellow card scheme in england uh there's the equivalent with the fda in america and every country will have the equivalent uh you know these things make a difference it, it caused the fda to put out a warning about benzodiazepines a couple of years ago because of work by nicole and her, her friends um you know write letters uh to to, to doctors make complaints you know, that's how the system gets feedback. It's those things are set up. Um, so I, I would say, 
uh, you know, spread spread the message because it'll it'll protect the health of other people. You know, I'm you know I'm I'm very keen to tell my friends about their children to be very careful about making choices about medication. So there are, you know, so I I put that to to what what's already been said. Okay. So last question, I guess, and then we'll wrap up. But let's talk about the future. Um, do you see any signs of progress on the issue? And, and um, what is your hope for the future? I'd just say, Mark, there's progress. I've seen you in lots of mainstream articles lately that were not popping up so much anymore because of your systematic umbrella review. So that one's kind of gone viral. But what do you think? Um, every time I think we're taking a step forward, someone someone punches me in the head and we go three steps back. But um, look, I, I think um, I think on the issue of withdrawal from psychiatric drugs, there is more and more attention paid. It's just there's just too many people involved for it to to not not get out there. I mean, you know, there are doctors affected, as you can see on this webinar. There are um, you know, there are politicians affected, there are wealthy people, there are, you know, so there's there's more and more people. It's just when one in six of the population are on these drugs, everybody's affected by it, you know, journalists, lawyers. So I think inevitably there'll be more and more um, attention paid. You know, the, the uh, corporations and their academics, you know, only have so many lines to use and they're sort of being demolished one by one. Um, so I, I think there will be progress on this issue, um, you know. And I think that, and I think naturally, it will call into question, you know, what are we doing with these medications in general? Should we be prescribing them as easily as we are? Um, you know, there's, I guess, there's, there's, uh, there's forces on both sides of that argument, but uh, I think, I think it will slowly get better. Maybe with the exception of America. <laughs> I'm sorry to to say that to a, an American interviewer, but. Uh, but in America, you know, with a few exceptions, the, the, the grip of drug companies on conversations and research and guidelines it just seems so near complete. I, I, I'm not sure what will happen. But I think in, in Europe and England, where there's a bit more balance between governments, public health systems and, and corporations, there seems to be more progress. That, that to me, seems the major uh, variable in, in, in the differences between different countries. Sorry, Americans. Yeah. Louise? Um, I don't think I've got anything to add to that. No. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess thank you so much, Mark and Louise, for joining and for telling your stories and answering these questions for World Tapering Day. I'm just honored to sit alongside both of you. I think as medical providers, it's so important to come forward when you've been harmed and tell your stories. I've heard so much feedback from people saying, you know, it shouldn't be this way. But when a regular person tells their story, who's not medically trained, my doctor didn't, you know, would sort of brush it off. But when I took a video of another doctor telling their story that they were harmed, my doctor really listened. So I think, um, you know, you guys coming forward and sharing is really important and, and having people having these tools, you know, to use from other medical providers who are willing to step forward and say, yeah, it happened to me too. I was harmed. This is real. Um, so thank you so much for, for telling your stories today. Um, and I guess now we will close and uh, at the end of this, we'll go into the Q&A portion. So thank you. Welcome to all of you. Great to have you here. And um, it's super good information, everything that you say. Uh, if you could only tell people one thing before they start withdrawing off psych meds, what would it be and why? Nicole? Yeah, so I would say um, the mistake I made that if I could go back and tell my old self before I withdrew would be to get as educated as possible before doing anything with the drugs that you're taking. Yeah. I, you know, acted very impulsively. And as soon as I found out the drugs were harming me, I wanted them out of my body, which we all know is the worst thing to do is to come yeah. off of them rapidly. So I wish I would have taken the time 
and really gone into some of the support groups online and learned from the people who have done this before me and who had valuable information to share and, you know, read the Ashton Manual and um, all the things that exist out there to educate yourself with. We also know that when you make mistakes, sometimes they can't be fixed so easily or there's like the kindling phenomenon. And so getting it right the first time is super important. So that's my answer. It is. And uh, actually, I hear this remark quite often uh, as a patient's advocate. I often get uh, messages from people who say, I need to get this drug out of my system. And they've been using it for 10 years. And I'm thinking, what's the hurry? Please don't talk like that. But they're totally focused on it. And sometimes I think it doesn't matter what I say. They just want that. All of a sudden, they become totally fixed and focused on it. What is that? Who who would like to comment on that? Yeah, I was just about to say, I mean, Nicole Nicole said it herself. I think when you realize that something is like something chemical is harming you that you're putting in your body, like the natural reaction is to stop putting it in your body as quickly as possible. Um, And I think, you know, I know from friends who are tapering over a very long period of time, I think it's very painful to have to continue to take a small amount of something every day that you are aware has really severely harmed you. Despite that, you know, it, it's clearly a very important thing to do to take it. Yeah. And, uh, well, someone else, this is Rosie, she asked, and uh, that uh, question actually uh, tags on to this subject uh, quite well. Uh, What do you think of tapering slowly versus being exposed to the drug drug for the shortest possible amount of time? That's a bit of a, yeah. What should take prevalence there? Anyone? More? I mean, uh, so that, that's, I mean, that, that's the central issue here with these drugs is you're balancing two harms. Uh, it's not harm benefit, it's harm harm. The harm of being on the drugs, which are causing people adverse effects and, and, and uh, who no one quite understands the long-term damage versus coming off them too quickly, which could cause people even more trouble. So you've got to try to steer between those two different poles. And in general, what people have generally arrived at is the way to uh, square that circle is to do it slowly. You have to accept that you're being exposed to the drug while you're tapering. And that is a cost, but, but the cost of coming off too quickly is greater than the damage caused most of the time by being on the drug. And then sometimes it's a bit less evenly balanced. If there's some severe acute effect that you need to get off the drug because it's life threatening, well, that would justify going a lot quicker. So I, I try to balance those things depending on people's circumstances and there is no perfect answer. And yes, there's harm in both directions. And uh, uh, then uh, people are also wondering for a slow taper, what do you think of the Ashton method or tapering strips? What could you tell us about that? I can speak on the Ashton manual some. I mean, you know, she developed it back in the 90s when she had a clinic in the UK and she saw patients of her own who were tapering off of benzodiazepines and she worked closely with them and really used their feedback uh, and experience in order to develop the manual. But I will say since then, I think, um, I mean, she's clear in the manual that it's just a guideline that doctors and also patients aren't supposed to follow it, you know, to the T. You're supposed to adjust it based on your own circumstances, how you're feeling when you're reducing, you can certainly go slower than some of her schedules. But I think uh, since the 90s, when the the patients in the online support communities have had the chance to connect, um, they've come up with, you know, more innovative ways to sort of take the concepts in the Ashton Manual and perfect them and make them better. For example, using like liquid Valium from the manufacturer and making even smaller reductions than what is recommended. So it's a great guide. It ha- None of the concepts about what benzos are or how they work have changed. It's just the people doing it have sort of taken it and made it, made it better. 
I see. And uh, uh, does any one of you have experience with tapering strips? Um, yes, I do. Yes. So I, I, I think there are um, advantages and drawbacks to using tapering strips versus mm -hmm. liquids, depending on, on who, yes. who you're talking about. I think the advantage of tapering strips is it's very um, user friendly. You don't have to do anything complicated for somebody who, who um, can't get their head around making dilutions and measuring out small doses. Um, it's uh, useful that it can make you make small reductions day by day. I think a drawback is the lack of flexibility to it, that you're set on a trajectory that you may not be able to tolerate. And mm. it's more difficult to revise that. So you could use a rescue pack to go back to a high dose, but it's a bit, you're, you're being sent down a slide. Uh, so I, I think it's, I actually, I run a clinic that helps people come off medications. I use both liquids and tapering strips. I tend to use tapering strips for people who, who have a pretty good idea of what they can do. I rarely, I rarely use the suggested tapering strips on the website. I generally use slower trajectories because you can order, um, you know, your own bespoke version. It's actually cheaper if you, if you have it the same every day, uh, every, every day for a month. Um, so people who know what they're doing, I give it to them because it makes life easier. But generally to start with, I use liquids because there's a lot, much greater flexibility. You can make any size reduction that you want. Go back, if you get into trouble, you can increase it. So I generally find it's easier to start with liquid. And sometimes I'll switch people to tapering strips when they know what they're doing. Pros and cons, depending on who you talk. Really quickly, Mark, too, the tapering strips are, I know they're available like in the U.S., but it's, you'd have to have them mailed over, correct? So that could long yeah. waiting period. Yeah. You Same always well. need to order them in advance and uh, look ahead and that can be a problem sometimes. Although on the other hand, then I would think that measuring out liquid with a syringe is maybe a bit nerve wracking as well, but probably it depends on how strong the liquid is. If it's not that strong, it's not so uh, easy to make a mistake. So I would feel a bit more confident myself to pull that up instead of thinking like, ooh, 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 is it one drop too much? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I think that, that's exactly right. People get a bit nervous. Am I making a mistake with the liquid? A little bit more confidence comes from the tapering strips. That's definitely one advantage. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I have a question here from uh, someone in the audience. She, she's also a Louise. And she asks about genetic testing. Could genetic testing for people who really suffer bad withdrawal symptoms, could that help? towards finding a maybe a common gene uh, to predict if someone is sensitive to dosage changes and that sort of thing. Do you think that is genetically determined? It's a difficult question. Mm -hmm. Louise, what, what would you say about that? I think that's the hope with genetic testing. My impression at the minute is that we're not, you know, we're not there yet. But yeah. And then uh, 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 we also have a lot of uh, uh, questions from people uh, that are um, that are more about um, it's a, a different view. Like uh, Geraldine says, how come academics who transmit knowledge to psychiatrists, uh, uh, how can they be funded by pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies how is that allowed and she says it sounds like things are corrupted what would we say to her it does sound like that yes i mean yes it's unbelievable i mean it's, you, you sort of wouldn't get advice from a health coach who's being paid by cigarette companies um no. and yet there's there's a bizarre circumstance where People that are educating doctors, the public, informing guidelines, writing the curricula for medical schools, examining students and doctors are also being paid six or seven figures per year by drug companies. Their, their, their reply would be, and has been in the public in the past, is being paid that money doesn't influence what I say. 
study after study says that's not the case, as you as you might not be surprised to learn. Um, in England, which I know better than other places, there is not even a law that you have to disclose how much money you get. The only the only guidelines that exist is when you publish an academic article, you've got to write which companies have given you support, yeah. but you don't need you don't need to say how much it is. So sometimes you see after a, an academic paper, there are there's almost as long a list of companies as there are words in the paper. And you can guess that there's vast amounts of money being um, uh, involved, but you don't know how much it is. And, you know, we know that paying a doctor $15,000 to give an hour lecture about their material to the company will uh, not surprisingly uh, endear them to the company and make them uh, speak more favorably of their products. Yeah. But surely this can only happen when uh, everybody, like all actors in this, accept that. So that's doctors, governments, colleges of psychiatrists, health insurance companies, everybody knows it. And now the patients are getting this information too. But all the, the real actors, they know it. Why are they getting away with this? I think it's probably more subtle than that. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that is the reality. That is what's what's happening the way that Marx described it. But I think the people involved probably telling themselves that they are looking at good quality research and they're maybe not asking, you know, they're maybe not looking at the bigger picture or questioning what's being passed to them in as much detail as they should. But I don't believe that they're, I mean, this is my opinion and I might be wrong, but I don't believe that they're, consciously thinking this is a corrupt thing to do. I think they're they're saying this looks like a good quality piece of research and I'm going to promote it. And they tell themselves that um, yeah. in order to feel comfortable with what's happening. So I think it's I think it's more subtle than kind of out and out corruption, but it the impact is still obviously very concerning. But uh, I understand what you're saying. So um yes, yeah, so it's not a conspiracy, but it's something that's going on and um yeah, in the meantime, uh, patients, uh, some patients suffer dreadfully as uh, U3, for instance, and, uh, well. Can I, can I just add something? I'm, I'm not so quite as kind-hearted as Louise is. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's true. What she's saying about the average doctor is true. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, there clearly is a strategic marketing program from drug companies they're not they're not spending hundreds of billions of dollars a year in marketing their products in a stupid way they are targeting their payments that are high yield for profits um you know there are all sorts of you can read there's all sorts of books written about doctors who have sort of jumped the fence they're told don't say that in a lecture you're talking about the adverse effects too much this is the preferred language you know they they seed the literature with memes um, you know, the famous one is for opioids from Purdue Pharmaceuticals. They put out the idea that this drug is less addictive and they put it in the mouths of professors uh, from Harvard and in, in education. You know, those that was a strategic choice. They knew that was false to sell their products. I think there are, I think there are similar things that come for antidepressants. Every time I hear someone say a sentence that I've heard Dozens of other people say with the exact same word. And they, when, when people are constantly repeating antidepressants are life saving, that they're, um, they're safe and effective, that withdrawal effects, discontinuation effects are mild and brief. I, 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 I figure that if everyone's repeating the same words, it's coming from some marketer's um, you know, strategic plan. Um, you know, whether, I, guess, I guess the question is are these. Are these academic spokespeople, are they deluding themselves or are they deluding others? Probably they're deluding themselves. Probably they're saying this is, we are helping people, you know, yeah. these are new yeah. drugs and I'm saying things that are helping people and I just happen to, you know, be making money out of it. That's the way humans operate. I'm sure no one is, is sort of, you know, laughing to themselves at night that they've tricked people. I guess that's, that's probably, the, that's human psychology. We prefer to think of us, ourselves as virtuous people. And, and maybe uh, they just uh, want uh, they like they like to go for the quick fix and not uh, send people to a, a psychotherapist and um, 
maybe some people don't even want to go to a psychotherapist. Maybe they prefer uh, to bury uh, their um, bad feelings under some medication. Only, of course, the problem is that they don't really know what they're letting themselves in for. And that is, of course, a very, very bad thing. That's, it's funny you bring that up, Carol. I mean, that was definitely my experience when I tried to start to talk to my patients about the risks of antidepressants. Um, that was my experience when I started to try and talk to my patients about the risks of um, medications and risks of withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, I had some, some people were receptive, but, uh, you know, there was a really significant proportion of people that got very upset that I was suggesting that um, the treatment that they were hoping to receive might not be something I was recommending. They you know, they'd already arrived at the consulting room and very much believing that this was the thing that was going to help them. And so it actually led to some very, very uncomfortable conversations when I was trying to present an alternative kind of yes. to them. So I think, you know, I think that's that's in the mix as well. So so maybe the solution could be to uh, to do a bit of both to uh, like uh, uh, satisfy the patient by maybe giving them short term medication, but also insisting that they uh, add some therapy to that. Perhaps I mean I think I think the solution is is going to be much longer term, and it's about having these kinds of conversations and, and raising awareness, the message, trying to get the message out there that medications. Um, do come along with some very serious risks so that people can make a more balanced kind of informed decision for themselves. Yes, yes, yes. But then it's also difficult to get that kind of information out to a quarter billion people who are using this stuff. How are you going to communicate with them even? You know, we're all with our organizations and... Uh, and uh, Nicole and Mark and uh, World Tapering Day and all those great organizations. We're always gathering information, getting it out there, inviting people to talk. And uh, sometimes I feel like, well, OK, I hope that we are reaching the people who are not already in our information circle. But I would like to reach the people who are outside of that circle. And that's so hard. Mm. Now, the media is good, of course, and, uh, well, uh, Mark is uh, uh, having some uh, success in the media, so uh, that's good. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's not enough. Of course, it should be more. What could we do? Well, I think even when you have black box warnings on things sometimes, you know, people, when they fill the prescription and... and um, in America, anyways, it's called a black box warning. I don't know what in the UK, if it's yeah. called something different. But um, a lot of patients just don't read that or they don't see it in the pamphlet that's coming with the information or they sort of disregard it as, you know, all medications can have troubling side effects. It's the way we sort of think, you yeah. know, which I was going to add to what Mark was saying about, you know, um, the, the marketers up top definitely know what they're doing, but I remember back when I was fresh out of school and starting to work as a PA, just, I laugh now at like the, the level of naivete that I had <laughs> just thinking like the FDA was there to protect us and, you know, medications help and don't harm and, um, you know, just that like... Uh, w when I got injured, I remember saying out loud to my dad, who's also a physician, like, we need to let, like, the drug companies know that. And he, like, laughed harder than I've ever seen, like, as if, he, you know, like, he knew the drug companies don't care that you're injured by this medication. But my naive thinking was, like, we had this system that was set up for patient safety, and it's just not the case, really. No. And uh, now, actually, uh, there's also a couple of questions, uh, people saying, well, I sued the this and that, the so-and-so in my country. They're bringing uh, um, organizations to court. What do you think of that? Of course, it gives uh, things a bit more high profile, 
could that be good? I, I know what history has shown. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. in, 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 so England, one thing is extremely different between England and America. Mm -hmm. In England, it's, it's, it's almost unheard of these days for doctors to prescribe long-term benzodiazepines. The guidelines essentially say you can prescribe it for a few weeks, two to four weeks, in the case of crisis. Yeah. There are people that are left on the on the medications, but but these days most general practitioners will say, you know, take one on a plane. Don't use more than that. You'll become you become tolerant to it. If you use it, use it a couple of times a month. Be yeah. careful. Yeah. Where in America, it's still one of the biggest selling classes of medication. It's 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 as almost as common as antidepressants, and I think one of the reasons for that uh -huh. was widespread lawsuits against general practitioners for prescribing open-ended benzodiazepines in the 90s and 2000s. So right. one, of the, one of the professors um, of psychiatry who was very involved in this, Malcolm Lader, spent his career trying to publish papers about the dangers of benzodiazepine withdrawal, mm -hmm. uh, trying to influence guidelines, trying to give lectures to different uh, medical groups. And at some point, I think 30 years into his career, he said, I've decided that the medical profession will not be changed by the medical profession. It's only the legal profession that will change the medical profession's mind. And he encouraged lawsuits. And there were, there were class action lawsuits about prescribing benzodiazepines that I was told, I don't think they were, I don't think they were successful, but they were enough of a, um, of a fright that yeah. G, GP, um, the groups, what do they call the um, the groups that sort of the GPs form started telling their members don't prescribe benzodiazepines because uh, you know you'll get you'll get into into legal trouble if you do so, and that 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 has influenced largely what practice is in England these days, which, as I said, is very different from America. So well, that's good news, but uh, of course, an antidepressant is quite different from a benzodiazepine, isn't it? It's looked upon different, differently, and uh, of course, a doctor is not going to say, "Oh, only take uh, one antidepressant a week." But maybe, maybe still uh, uh, continuing on the court case subject, if, you know, you get so many people also who have bad damage, injury from the medication. If they would go to court and say, look, this has happened to me. And also in the question box, I've seen uh, several uh, people uh, mention this happened to me, that, that, that. And um, maybe it's uh, up to them or indeed uh, up to a class action. And I've been thinking many times, why is this subject not picked up in, for instance, in a European context? And I wrote to an organization for human rights, uh, uh, mental health in Europe, but uh, no luck. No, they didn't even answer me. And I just said, isn't this uh, something that should be looked into? I didn't go like, whoa, it's scandalous. And I just uh, said, uh, would you like to uh, go into conversation about this? But they didn't even reply. What is that? I, I yeah. found that strange. I feel like we need a session on the sort of legal aspect of, of this, Carol. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly no legal expert. The small, the small amount I've looked into it, I think there are sort of obstacles to people taking these companies to court. Um, I think, again, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert. I don't know how true this is, but I've heard that once a drug um, finishes its patent, once a drug out of patient, patent and becomes generic, you can no longer. Nobody is it. liable anymore. Exactly. So I think yeah. all those sorts of all those sorts of complications that people have to work through. But I think it would. I think you're right. I think it would be really helpful to arm ourselves with more information about it. And you also have to consider the people that would be responsible for suing their physician, for example are incredibly ill and stressful multi-year oh, yeah. that costs a lot of money even sometimes in america anyways you would yeah. sometimes have to put up th uh, 30 40 50,000 to pay for your expert testimony etc it's 
yeah. a lot. Mm. Yeah, so it would have to be a class action. Nobody can do that on their own, not really. And like you said, the stress, the cost. Well, it, it's something, you know, maybe it will be a next step. We don't know. I understand there was a successful class action lawsuit in America for paroxetine. I, I can't remember how long ago, but um, I know that they... They managed to, there were, I think there were about 30 people and um, they had a successful result with that. And mm -hmm. um, I remember, because the drug that I was on was Venlafaxin and I remember looking into, you know, whether that was something I could pursue. Um, all the information online seemed to suggest that the, um, it would mostly be in, in the US is what I understand. And all the, um, all the legal firms that do that kind of work had ruled out um, any further court cases using looking at effects or then the facts in. So I, I felt like from what I could see, it was a dead end then the facts in, but I, you know, who knows. Just say, I, I agree with Louise that suing drug companies is very difficult, especially when it's off patent, but that's a, that's a very different, uh, issued yeah. in suing a doctor that's given bad advice. Oh, a doctor, I, uh, I don't know. I, I don't really blame the doctor. I, I think it's the bigger, the bigger picture. I don't blame the doctor, but, but then the responsibility is diffused throughout the entire system and a, and a message is sent by that's giving true. feedback to some component of the system. So yeah. for example, I had a very nice little old lady GP who prescribed me my medication. I hold it no ill will. I'm, I don't think she would ever have taken more than a pen from a drug company. But I give great thought to suing her, not because I want to cause her trouble, but otherwise there is no feedback in the system to to, to the system. Um, so uh, I'm not I'm not sure because otherwise the the doctors say, well, I was reading what was in the pamphlets given by the drug companies. The drug companies say, well, it's off patent, so it's not our responsibility now. Uh, the guidelines say we're doing it off the published papers, so sort of there's no there's nowhere to to receive feedback. Um, it's just one thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, meanwhile, uh, there's a whole bunch of questions here. Let's see. There's none so blind as he or she who does not wish to see, says Clive Sherlock. No. He's the detective, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I interviewed a, a woman whose specialty was willful blindness and uh, the parallels between willful blindness and other parts of things and also in what we deal with with these medications and stuff was just, that's why I had her because I there was finally a term for what I was looking for, which was willful blindness we we all do it as human beings it's just part of being human but when you know what it is you can be more aware of it and know if you're being willfully blind yeah and one of the most profound things she said is i said well how do we how do we become less willfully blind as people and she said uh look for your friends and family and colleagues who are questioners who mm -hmm. don't just you know who are raising questions about things and uh so that's what we should all do, I think, is pay attention to those types of things more. Right. So that's raising awareness together. Maybe maybe uh, you could tell us about how you see the future for yourself personally now, at this point of taper that you're in, and how do you see yourself in five years? Who would like to tell us something about that? Like, like uh, maybe work-wise, uh, taper-wise, health-wise. Nicole? Um, well, I hope in five years that I will be fully recovered from this nightmare of an experience. I mean, I've been off the medications for almost 10 years now, so that would be a super long withdrawal. If it was still going on, I'd, I hope it won't be. Um, I feel like I have improved some since the beginning, so I try to hang on to hope that the end is near. Um, for now, I just keep doing, you know, what I feel I'm called to do, which is raising awareness about this and educating people and getting involved in 
initiatives that I feel like are going to make a positive impact in this space. And eventually, I think I would like to start practicing again and seeing patients and helping uh, with, you know, discontinuation of medications and polypharmacy and that kind of thing. I would love to be able to do that, but obviously I have to get myself well first before I can be of value fully to other people in that way. So that is my goal and hope. Yeah. It's a nice one. Mm. Who's next? Louise? Uh, similar to Nicole, I'm, I'm not tapering. Um, I, I've been off completely for, for five years now. Um, I hope in five years' time. Um, I, am, I have been having a very good window recently. Um, and I have to say I feel better than I have in the whole of the last five years. So watch this space. I really hope that, yeah, in the not too distant future, I'll be completely well. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know. This is the first time I've come forward and spoken publicly about my experiences. That feels like, feels like something that's really important to do to, um, I think unless we tell our stories, unless we speak about what's happened, um, and our experiences, then nothing's going to change. Um, but it, I, I'm just in the infancy, I suppose, of um, doing this kind of work. And yeah, watch this space. So, Mark. Um, well, I guess on a, on, a, on a personal note, I'm the only person here who is not yet off their medication. And uh, that's it's been a constant uh, conflict for me between doing work in this space and uh, doing doing what I'm preaching, which is coming off the medications. Um, so at some point, I would like to actually do a bit less work so I could focus a bit more on coming off medication. Um, uh, I'm sometimes jealous of my patients because they're, they've got the space to do it. Um, but, but I guess alongside that, you know, my, I mean, all my research and all my work is in this space. I'm running a clinic now. I've been to expand in, in London and doing research in this area, trying to raise awareness about it. I've started, actually I've helped some people in America and Canada open uh, basically at the equivalent of what I do in my clinic in London as a digital clinic in America, because you know one of the things I have is the most horrible inbox in the world where I get dozens of people asking me for help to come off medication, mostly in North America. Um, and I sort of, uh, different points I've had to turn off the contact page on my website because it floods my inbox. And so when a couple of people ask me, do I want to help set up a, a clinic that would take people off in a very slow manner and in a supported way, I said, you know, yes, if it clears my inbox, I'll do anything. Um, so that's one thing we're helping out with now. You know, and I, as I said, I, to end on a slightly optimistic note for people, you know, I think people should, you know, I think this will become more and more in the fore. I think there has been progress in the last few years that's obvious to people, yes. um, you know, media, scientifically, politically. So I, 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 you know, I encourage people that are well enough to, uh, um, you know, to do what little bit you can. It doesn't have to be starting an organization or giving public talks, but, but you know, talking to friends, writing a letter, whatever it is, all of those things matter. You know, we've talked about this 250 million people, you know, affected by these drugs. So there's a lot of people to, 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 to pitch in and to help. So uh, I'm, although I'm generally a bleakly pessimistic person, um, I'm, even I can see that rationally, objectively, there is, there is positive momentum here. And so I think inevitably this will become uh, an issue in the open air. Let's hope it will be. Well, I think I should just say to all of you, thank you so much for giving your time and your personal stuff, you know, to for everybody to hear and to understand. And uh, that's so valuable. And uh, I thank you so much for it.